Good morning, everybody. All right, so before we share any of our stories, we're just going to take a brief moment and look at some of the pictures that we took just to give you an idea of what we experienced every day throughout our trip.
I think the thing that stood out to me most was um, the orphans, um, just how um, a lot of them, they had parents, but they were abandoned, and um, their parents would come to visit them once a year. Um, they just didn't want them, and um, that was really heartbreaking for me. Um, I spoke at some of the orphanages, and just seeing their reactions, um, I <laughs> almost brought me to tears. Um all the kids there, um, they had so much love even though they were hurt so much. And, um, like every time I, I didn't want to leave Africa, <laughs> um, it was really amazing just how much they would reach out for love and, yeah. Um, <laughs> what I got out of the most probably was um, the fact that they all have so little and us Americans have so much. And we were over there when Thanksgiving was happening. So just to think that um, when, while we were there helping kids that had little to no food, there were so many Americans, you know, filling their face with turkey and pie and all this good food while they just had, like, nothing. And... Like, I've always known that they've had little nothing, but actually to be there and to hold the kids that are just so hungry, it was just heartbreaking. Well, needless to say, it was an amazing trip. Um, this isn't my first rodeo to Africa, but it was my first time going to Ghana, and I can definitely say that between Mozambique, where I went last time, and Ghana, there were a lot of differences, um, and just you learn something different every time you go on a missions trip, and I definitely learned a lot and got to experience a lot. Just overall, it was just an amazing trip, and it's, it's awesome to be put in a situation where you're pretty much forced and challenged to live out your life and your faith every single day. Um, you can't just sit on the sidelines like we have the opportunity to here 
and, you know, put God on a shelf. You're actually forced to live it out and minister to people. And that was really challenging for me, and I got a lot out of that. Um, during our trip, we were able to do a ton of stuff. The pictures were just a snippet of everything we did. It was, it was the fastest two weeks of my life. But some of the things that we got to do, uh, we ended up ministering to a lot of different local churches and going to their services and being able to preach messages and pray for people, which was an awesome experience. We also got to partake in a local crusade of churches, and it's really an awesome uh, concept because in Africa, everyone, all the churches are pretty individualistic. Like, you go here, they don't really get together and do stuff like we do here. So the fact that 15 local churches in Africa got together and had this meeting for a few nights was awesome in itself. It's just a miracle. So that was a great experience. We got to dance with the Africans. We got to pray for people. Um, it was just different things. Uh, some of the other things we got to do was we got to distribute food and clothes um, to the local villages, as well as all of the new spore and, and the baby clothes that the kids' church and you guys have helped us with. It was great to be able to hand that item to that person and know that you know this is from us, from like a local friend that donated it, or maybe it was something that I had and I had wanted to give it to someone special. It was really, really awesome to be able to do that. So I just also wanted to thank you guys for all your donations and being able to bless the people over there. They were really appreciative, for sure. Another thing that we did was we got together, I believe the day before Thanksgiving, maybe two days before, and we went and we fed the lepers. And it, uh, you wouldn't think, you know, leprosy is alive and well today. You think, oh, it's a biblical thing. Well, it's... It's definitely dying out, but there's still cases of it. There is a cure for leprosy, but it's not, um, it hasn't been really distributed to all corners of the earth yet, so we're hoping that it'll get there eventually. But until then, these people have to live basically in solitude in a camp where no one will visit them, no churches will come to minister to them. They can't really go and buy too much food. They kind of rely on whatever they can grow themselves, which really limits them. So we got together. And we brought a ton of different food, and we got to bless them um, with the food, with clothes, and the kids that live there, they don't have leprosy, but their parents do. So unfortunately, they're forced to live there because that's all they've ever known. So we also got to play games with them and give them little juice boxes and candy and that kind of thing, and they seem to have a great time. Um, we also got to go to a lot of schools in the area and preach to them. As well, um, we, pr we gave messages to kids anywhere from preschool to high school, in different ages, different, um, some all-girls schools, all-boys schools, mixture, um, different in uh, income levels. We had the really poor, we had the more, um, the better off. So it was really good to get a big, diverse um, selection of people to preach to and be able to minister that way. Um, another thing we got to do was just spend time and play with the kids, and that was my personal favorite. I've always had a heart for kids. Um, even just watching some of the pictures, I just started to get a little emotional. I won't admit it, but I do. <laughs> and I just love the kids. I love being able to just spend time with them and just love on them and to show them God's love through my actions and through just stepping out and just being there for them. Because they don't, some of them don't get very much attention, especially those that are orphaned. And they just have, they live in their confinement, and that's about it. Um, we also got to go down to the local uh, fisherman village and bring in the nets. Um, that was very hard work. Uh, I tried my best, but I don't really know if I contributed that much, but I like to think that I did. But we got to do that. It's really, really hard work. It takes about, oh, four to six hours at least to bring in two miles of net. Very slow process. It's basically like a foot, a pole, and it, that's but with um, a bunch of people doing it, and it's kind of sad in a sense because you, they toil and they toil and they bring in nets and there's only a little bit, and it's really unfortunate. And it's gotten even worse over the years because the Chinese have been offshore fishing, which has really limited the population that they are able to fish from. So we got to help with them. We also got to do some really cool stuff with the local orphans. We got to 
host uh, an orphanage party for one of the orphanages, and we invited them to our hotel. We played games. We gave them candy. We just loved on them. We just got to talk to them and just really get to um, just love on them, really. So that was great. And then another thing we got to do is we got to take some orphans from um, another orphanage and take them to a pool. Now, you wouldn't think, okay, well, you know, they have the ocean right there. You know, they probably won't be that excited about a pool, but they loved it, except some of them wouldn't get in the water, but that's okay. They they t t stuck their hands in. That was all good. But it was, a, it was a really fun time to just be able to play with them and just to love on them as well. So that was kind of an overview. And then there's some moments that really stood out to me and really impacted me. Um, the first one was when we went to the the first church. We went there um, on a Sunday morning, and their worship's very different. It's very passionate, upbeat, loud. Oh my gosh, it's loud. It's crazy. And they don't mix their music very well. I think everyone was singing and playing their own song. But they were all worshiping really passionately, which is really important. And there was one guy, he was kind of like the worship leader. So he gets up there, and he has two um, crutches, and you look down at his legs, and he basically had withered legs, if at all. He really just was basically only immobile from the waist up. But yet, even through his hardship, he was still going and praising after God passionately. And that really stood out to me because how many times do we, you know, come to church and we're like, oh, I don't want to worship because I prayed for this to happen and it didn't, so I'm just going to pout. And it showed me that, you know, this guy, he, I'm sure he had people pray for his legs to grow. I'm sure he prayed for a lot of stuff and it hasn't happened, but yet he still praises God and he still seeks after him. And that was really important and a really powerful message that I got. Um, another thing that really stood out to me was just spending time with the kids, as I mentioned, but just being able to love on them. One thing that I did notice between the culture of Mozambique and the culture of Ghana is a lot of the kids, not all of them, um, want to be your friend and love on you because they think they're going to get something from you, like candy or shoes or something. But it was awesome when you find those kids that didn't want your attention because they wanted something. They wanted your attention because they needed love, they needed acceptance. And that was really, um, really powerful for me to be able to fill that void and show the love of Christ through that. Um, another really big thing that really stood out to me was in regards to an orphanage that we went to. Um, it, his name was David. He kind of um, oversaw and he started it all. But to give you some background about the orphanages in Ghana and the way that they operate and have operated over the years, um, they just are really corrupt. There's tons of cases where the leadership of the orphanage will abuse the kids in various forms. Oftentimes when money or food is donated to the orphanage, the orphans actually don't end up seeing any of it. The leadership either takes it for themselves or they sell it so they can get money for their own gains. And it's just really, um, just really, really sad and corrupt and it's really unfortunate. But when we went to David's orphanage, we got to go to um, the, the place where he keeps them. And he lives in this house and there's a room for the girls and a room for the boys. And he had 16, 16 boys and four girls plus two of his own kids that he cared for and took care of. And we got to listen to his heart, and he was sharing with us, you know, he doesn't take anything. He feeds his kids rice and beans, and he eats rice and beans. They live in this house. He lives in this house. And you could just tell that he just had a heart for the kids, and he actually told us that he was looking to get more kids in, in his house and build a little... Um, addition on to house them and he just um, you could just feel the passion and just the humbleness of him and that you could just really tell that he was in it to glorify God and not his own kingdom and that was really important to me um, his heart is just in the right place and in addition to taking care of the orphanages he oh the, excuse me the orphans he also started a school now oftentimes schools at in, in Ghana the parents have to pay tuition for the kids to go there and unfortunately, not everybody can pay for such a luxury. So out of the goodness of his heart, he started a school where kids can come from wherever for free and get an education. 
and he's had he has a few kids that come an hour away and they walk and they just come because they want to be educated they want you know there's something good there that he's offering of both education wise and also spiritual because they do chapel and um, they seek God every day so that was really um, powerful and really stood out to me and then the final thing that really stood out to me was just going and being able to minister to the local churches in the area um, uh, there were just lots of interest, interesting ways like each kid um, there were many of our team members that stepped out of their their comfort zone and their comfort box and spoke to the people that we that go to that church they would preach a message that God laid on their heart and they were faithful in that and that was really impressive to me just being able to see the kids step out and say this is what I, God wants me I feel to say to these people we had some awesome experiences in that um, another thing was we just after every service we always had kind of an altar call a lot of them were saved so it wasn't really for salvation it was more of if you have any um, healing you need any uh, oppression you need broken any just basically anything you needed more of God we would pray for you and it was great to see all the kids and the members of our team get together and pray together because we represented about four or five different churches in our area so it was great to see everyone coming together and working at, uh, as a corporate body and then just getting to pray for people some of the awesome things that we got to experience when we prayed for people um, the one that stood out for me the most is because I have a heart for the kids was just getting to see a lot of kids with malaria just getting healed um, the early stages of malaria uh, symptom of it is they they'll get a headache from there it'll um, they'll get upset stomachs they won't eat and then it just kind of goes downhill from there we went to one church where almost all of the kids um, said that they had a headache so we were able to pray for them and I do believe a good portion of them were healed which is awesome because that's like the first stages and they're they're out in the bush so it's not like they could really get medicine to help them so that was really important um, we just got to see a lot of other awesome healings another profound thing was we went to a village and a message was preached about letting go of the witchcraft practices of in your life um, in that village it was known for the Christians would go to church on Sunday they would praise Jesus but then in the evening they would go and they would do their witchcraft um, traditions and obviously you can't worship two gods so there was a, an altar call that you know if you want to only worship God you come forward and we'll pray for you so we prayed for them and we left and then we heard later on the day that the whole village the chief got everyone together and said we're not going to practice witchcraft anymore we're gonna break that and that was an awesome experience to be able to be a part of that and to witness God's awesome power <laughs> yeah, so it was overall it was a great trip another great thing was just being able to see the youth of the trip really step out in their faith and I'm really really proud of um, our girls I'm biased of course I thought they were the best out of all of them but <laughs> I was really impressed with the way that they they took everything seriously um, and one awesome thing that I got to see was for about three months prior to us or two or three months prior to us leaving we've been having our youth ministry training sessions before youth group and that's been an awesome time it's just teaching the kids how to pray for people how to minister and just speak into people's lives we have about 10 or 12 that um, faithfully come every week but it was great to see our three girls take what they've learned in that session and be able to apply it so when we went to the villages and to the schools and all, it was just awesome so with that in mind I would really encourage you guys to come out tonight um, to let the rest of them have a chance to be able to use what they've learned and um, just apply it to their real lives and just be able to bless you as you guys have been able to bless them over the years. All right, first off, I want to say I'm happy to be back. I missed the cold 11 degrees. Um, I want to say three days ago I was walking around with shorts and no shirt, so I didn't sweat through all my church clothes. This kind of stinks. <laughs> um, First off, uh, this trip, I might say a lot of eyes in this trip because I thought it was like based off from what I experienced, but this trip was nothing based around me at all. It was all for God, 
Um, I matured a lot on this trip. I also uh, got there by the grace of God. Without him, I would have not made it. I turned Catholic for about two seconds on the airplane because uh, some turbulence hit. And originally, it wasn't that bad. When the um, went over the PA, you heard, hey, we're going to be experiencing some turbulence. Just take a seat. We have the seatbelt sign on. Not a big deal. About five seconds later, as I'm being jerked around, thrown left and right, you hear, sit down. So I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I made it. Problem was, is then we walked into customs. Apparently, it's universal when there's a big sign that shows a camera and a line through it. That means don't take pictures. So, unknowingly, I took out my camera. I walked up to the first sign I saw said Aquaba, which in Fonti means welcome. Took a photo of it, and I've captured the, uh, the two security guards that were in it. They were not happy. <laughs> they shook my hand and stole my camera. So, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was the joy of going over there. Um, secondly, I want to get this right off my chest before anybody gets blackmail on me. Um, it is a standard to hold guys' hands over there, and girls hold girls' hands. Now, I clarify this because I had gone to the beach for a little bit. We all did. And one of the interpreters came up and goes, and started talking to me and says, um, are you going in? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go in. You should go in, too. He was well-dressed. He had a black, uh, black tie, white shirt, nice pants. I was like, you guys should come in too. He goes, may I? Did, yeah, come on, get in your swimsuit. So he took off his pants and took off his shirt. All right, cool, we're down to our skivvies. Now, I've never had a man in a skivvies hold my hand and walk me into water before. <laughs> Africa's taught me a few new experiences. <clears throat> my loving wife videotaped it. You will all see it soon, I'm sure. <laughs> um, these are all little things too, like, on the grand scheme of everything, I think I was the most immature kid there. And I was also the oldest, besides Don. Um, <laughs> when we were giving out food, uh, normally the villagers would give us food. It was a very big custom in Africa that if someone gives you food, you take it. If they give you a drink, you take it. If you deny it, you're being rude. Now, this is okay, fine, and dandy if you know what it is you're eating and you like it. Um, I can't tell you how many gallons of coconut milk I was passed because none of the girls wanted it. But it was pretty good. We managed to have coconut milk. We got a snail. We had malt, which is like um, a gross drink. I can't explain it, but some of the girls gagged on it, which was embarrassing. It wasn't our girls, luckily. They were good. But um, one of the bigger key points that I saw in Africa that you don't see here is, is the worship, as Kelly had spoken on. In the worship, they play, and the music is not synchronized at all. Like, it would be like someone comes up here who can't sing or can sing, and starts on the microphone. And then someone who can't play the guitar plays on the guitar. And then someone who played trumpet once will start playing the trumpet. And then a kid who has a horrible case of ADHD just starts banging on the bongos. But in the end, it actually works out, and it's great praise and worship. Worship. It was amazing because in one of the villages, um, you got to see these people come up and just start playing on, um, I think it was a, a gas can or something like that. And what I thought was great about it was is if we had told them ahead of time, like, hey, we're going to come up, you know, just giving you a heads up. We'll be there. And they're like, okay, fine. So we show up, and we're like, hey, you ready to worship? Yeah. Let's go. And, like, they grab weird items, and you're like, okay, sure. Don't know if they're going to beat you up or not. But they start playing on and start worshiping. And it's the coolest thing, seeing people get into it. They had handkerchiefs, and they dance around. I didn't because I can't dance, and I was told to sit down by them. So <laughs> <laughs> they were nice, mostly. Um, Another thing that I noticed is, is they highly respect people who are married. Like, I'm going to go with that anyways. We went to a girls' school of 3,000 girls, and that one spoke to me. They really, <laughs> they respect marriage. <laughs> but it was cool because we got to go to um, two different schools, an all-guys school and an all-girls school. They're all very well-mannered, all very well-dressed. Um, they paid attention very well. I decided that it was going to be my time to preach there, and I haven't really done it before. Now, the biggest crowd I've ever spoken in front of was probably... Oh, 100, 150, maybe. That was in high school. I've always been in front of people. I've made a fool of myself in many different ways. So whatever, it's not a big deal. Well, we went to speak in front of, it was approximately 600 boys. And it was kind of a makeshift thing. They didn't really plan on for us, or plan for us to come and speak in front of the kids. So we just kind of got thrown into it. And I was like, oh, I got this. I became very prideful. If there's one thing I can say that this trip did for me, I don't know about anybody else, but it humbled me in such a way that I kind of realized that I wasn't very impressive of a person. Now, I, didn't, I don't think I have a lot of pride, but at this trip, 
anybody here raise your hand if you have like um oh what is it public speaking anxiety like you kind of get afraid and people are barely raising their hands yeah that's a good example <laughs> um <laughs> but I got so embarrassed I forgot the name of the church I attended and my wife's name for a second <laughs> now they had just gotten done speaking the um, speaker in front of me who had gotten up and spoke was a good teacher very good teacher he got up and spoke told everybody all the boys from the ages of 16 or 14 to 18 all about what's going on in the world like drug issues pornography um, thievery, crimes of all types, and you know, all these statistics. I was interested in it. I was like, oh, this is... I think this... Okay, we're good. Um, and he just gotten done telling everybody, you know, wait for marriage for the best part of your life or whatever and so forth. Now I get to stand up. I have nothing prepared. I just stood up and said, hello. Now this room was probably about as all the way over to that door and farther over on that way. No microphone. 300, oh, I'm going to say 250, 250... 100, so like 600 people. Not bad. When you have nothing prepared, you're a little nervous, and they go, okay, now preach, and you have nothing, it kind of stinks. It's like if I were to get up in front of you and I'll go, it wasn't good. They said, okay, we'll just talk about where you went to church. Kelly, <laughs> what's the name of our church? Like everybody's laughing at me at this point. Um, after that, I got to introduce the girls. Now, in case you don't know, 14 to 18-year-old boys, they have hormones. So, when I introduced the girls, because there's none around in the area, it was like I'd just done the most amazing preaching to anybody. I said, here's Cassie. <sighs> here's Audrey. <sighs> I was like, all right. Colleen. <sighs> and I was like, all right. And my wife, because I don't want anybody cheering too loud. My wife. And then erupted. <sighs> well, that's great. Cool. So I thought I won the crowd. Problem was, is a few seconds later, I had relied on myself and I stopped looking to God. And the reason I point this out is because I said, I've got this. Um, one of the things you should never do is, is claim that you have something that God has to have control of. Uh, when I stood up there and said, I've got this, I bombed. I stood in front of 600 people and felt naked. That is the most embarrassing thing I've ever had in my life, and I just stood there. I had no idea what to do. But through this humbling experience, Later on, I had preached at other um, villages uh, for the kids, and I got better progressively. By the end, I had my interpreter laughing so hard that he couldn't actually like complete my sentences, which is really cool. Um, but this is where I'm leading into is my interpreter, the best one I had, his name was Simpson. Simpson was a man who had lost his mind. Um, he's extremely humble, and I can't describe to you how happy of a person he is to have nothing. Like, as they had spoken of, when you go to Africa, or even in the Dominican, you see people who are poor. They have a house made of tin. In Africa, they have mud huts. They have things that are just grotesque. Like, they have bathrooms that make truck stop bathrooms clean enough to eat off the floor. It's gross. But Simpson is so humble that someone gave him a shirt, and he about broken tears. I just, I wish I could describe how happy and how dedicated this man was to God. He had lost in mind, or he had lost his mind. He had lost his wife. Lost his kid, job, money, house, you name it. The only thing he had was his insanity for a while. It wasn't until um, Bishop had come, which I don't know his last name. Bishop Spanford had come and prayed for him. They don't know if it was demonic or what it was, but he got his mind back. Since then, he has been the most, um, most amazing, energetic preacher that I've ever seen. He would start preaching so much that he'd go, and this and this and <gasps> Like, he really got into it. I've never seen a preacher do that. I was most impressed by him. Simpson also was such a humble person that over there, when you serve someone, you are loyal. Like, they would bring us water. They would interpret anything we wanted us to say. And I think the most loyal person there was Simpson because he did it because he wanted to do it for Christ. And he'd tell you, you know, God bless you. He'd pray for you. He'd do anything you want. He was just the most loving man I've ever met. Um, Cooper was. I got to know him a bit. I got him to pray for me, and I got to really know him. I wish I could go more on him, like how much more I got to know him, but total like time put together, I maybe spent like six hours with him. So moving on with experiences there. Um, one second, my handwriting's like a doctor's. Oh, we went to the village for voodoo, and we went to preach to people. 
it was very outdoorsy. A lot of the places we went, I loved it because there was no fancy spectacles of this and that. There was no mega screen, well, not mega screens, but like screen projectors, music. It was very just show up. And a lot of the time, they didn't show up on time. They just showed up when they heard music, which is kind of neat because I know a lot of people here in the U.S., they go to churches that are mega churches because their friends go because they want to look holy because, well, they got cool TVs. They got good music. There it was. Their music's okay. <laughs> their worship's pretty good. But they did it for Christ, which I thought was most amazing. These people who were even voodoo showed up to be polite. By the end, they had saved 25 people from voodooistic practices, which I thought was amazing, especially because when we first got there, the tribe leader had told us that voodoo doesn't exist here. Um, what I also thought was pretty cool is that none of our girls wanted to take up the chance to become a princess. In some of the villages, the tribe leader would ask to have one of the girls as a princess to help lead them to Christ. Now, I was tempted to leave behind some of the girls, but I was also warned that there was a certain price I had to get from them in order to leave something like Cassie or Colleen behind. It didn't work out. So, <laughs> um, when praying for people, I noticed a lot of the time that people didn't get excited. People would be healed, but they didn't care. For us, if we saw someone who was sitting in a wheelchair, they stroll in slowly, and you go, hey, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed, never stand up. Well, that's pretty impressive. How long were you out of there? Or how, were, how long were you, like, forced to be in a wheelchair? 20 years. Wow. Congratulations. There's nothing more awkward than praying for someone to be healed, and you're like, be healed. How long were you in the wheelchair? 20 years. You're not excited? Yeah, that's cool. Like that. A lot of the kids we prayed for, because it's hard to interpret what's going on with them, they had headaches and stuff, and they would be healed. Now, I won't lie, I kind of stink at praying for healing. I always thought, like, you know, don't pray like the Pharisees. Make it short, sweet. God knows what you want. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. I got better throughout time, don't worry. But at first I walk up, and I'm like, all right, what's wrong? Your head hurts. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. Did it work? <laughs> yeah. Your headache's gone. Yep. All right, great. Good job. <laughs> We heal people with um, arm problems, shoulder problems, knee problems, back problems, any problems that you could think of. Broken hearts was a weird one that I'd never heard being prayed for before, but a lot of people got that and just felt better overall. But no one got excited. That was kind of disheartening. I was warned about it, but like I said, if you see a miracle, that's amazing. You want to go, oh, that's great. They didn't care. Like, they just didn't. You could be healed from paralyzation. You could be given money, which was an interesting topic. You'd be given anything. They're like, yeah, okay. Now, when it came to money, Don Sauter had the best message I think I've heard there. We went to a school of them, um, mixed both girls and guys, and they started preaching. He took out $10 or 10 CD. 10 CD in American is like $4 and, I don't know, 60 or 80 cents. Our money's worth twice as much as theirs. Now, because I'm not good at math, we're going to go with it's worth $4.80. Um, he took out, or takes out $10 CD, and he goes, you know, you guys need not to focus on this. And everyone started talking. Everyone started getting panicked. So Don handed off the $10. The place erupted. Don took out 10 more dollars and said, this is nothing. And everybody erupted again. Handed the same girl. The girl was happy, and he blessed a girl who needed the money, so that was pretty interesting. But a lot of the people there, they don't care. They, they care for Jesus, but they're more focused on, like, worldly possessions. Kind of like us, but we have more entertainment value. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. Uh, yes. Sorry, I have ADD, so I tend to come in and out a lot. Once we had handed out um, some of the CDs and the kids started erupting and panicking and stuff, they lost all focus on God. They didn't care. They wanted money. This was common, like as uh, Kelly had spoken on, the kids wanted candy. They would come up and just desire, like, give me. They didn't care what you could do. They just want. Now, my loving and wonderful um, sister-in-law, had given me the experience of how many four-year-old children I could fight off. I maxed out at about 20. My sister-in-law, no, I have to explain this. When you hand out candy to kids, it's almost like a drug deal. It's awkward, but you just come up and you're like, hey, you got to shake their hand, you hit it in, and you just pass it off, walk away. The kid will look and go, like you just handed them drugs, they're going to be caught. So it's amazing how these kids are like, oh. but then there's always that one kid who will like, Toffee. And toffee is candy in um, Ghanaian uh, Bonte. And when one kid says that, every kid knows. It doesn't matter how quietly you do it. You can throw it and run. They'll find out. <laughs> so 
So my sister-in-law comes up, passes off a, ba a bag of candy to me. I get it, and all I hear is, good luck. <laughs> she took off. I look up. I've never been scared before. If you've ever seen World War Z or any zombie movie where, like, they all just charge a person, I grabbed a tree. These kids shook at me. Like, I didn't know what to do. I threw the bag. Six kids died, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we prayed they came back, no worries. But it's interesting to see how these people react. And I thought it was weird. I was like, well, these kids are really ill-behaved. But whatever. The adults do it, too. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever been told that their two-month-old needs a lollipop. But that's not a good idea. <laughs> um, but the interesting part after all was said and done that I got to learn about Africa was is there were people who had very good values. I love the fact that people there loved Christ for who Christ was and what he had to offer us. It wasn't how much money he could give you. The happiest people I got to meet there didn't have a lot. The most miserable seemed to have the most. Corruption was everywhere there. You had to expect it. But as I had pointed out, everyone who loved Christ had like an empty void filled in. They had no problems. People would worship, dance, regardless of time. Some people would fall asleep. That was always interesting when you're preaching. But, as I was saying, after all is said and done, you could tell who loved Christ and who loved money. As Kelly had pointed out, there's ministries everywhere around there. And I'm going to butcher this, but it was Gandhi, I think, that said Christianity is a thousand miles wide and is it two inches deep? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, two inches deep. Yeah, Christianity was everywhere there. Everyone there is trying to butcher Christianity in the sense of they need money. You need money. You need to have um, a baptism done in fresh water. Cost like 5 CD. Some people there don't get 5 CD in two months. Luckily, as we came in, and Don and I got to share a lot of the messages, it got better. We helped clear up a lot. Churches started coming together. We may have not done great miracles, like lift anybody from the dead, but just a little bit that we did do in Christ's name, I really think helped people out in the area. Um, I also learned that when I've lost everything and like have no idea what I'm talking about, Don said just pray. It seems to be a pretty good idea. So I'd like to pray with you guys real quick and wrap this up. <laughs> Lord, I just thank you for helping us share our journey with all these people. I'd like to thank you for all that you've done for us, for safe travels to and from. But I pray that you bless both Ghana and us, and I pray that we are growing closer to you every day. I pray that we not let the worldly focuses of our mind overtake us, and that we continue to focus on you more than anything else. Thank you, Lord, for all you've been doing for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.